Hello there, members. Welcome and good evening, everybody. I think we've got lots of new faces today to kick off our 2023. So hello and welcome. My name's Anna Spooner. I'm part of the tastings and events team here at the Wine Society. If we've not met before, then welcome. I hope that you'll find this evening educational but enjoyable. Um, and that's my MO with these online tastings. I like to mix a little bit of education in with plenty of fun and, of course, wine drinking as well. Behind the scenes tonight, we have the lovely Mahesh. So good evening, Mahesh, and thank you so much again for joining us. You'll see he's just popped on the chat. He is called Tastings Team tonight. If you've got any questions you want to direct to me and Mahesh, then on the chat, you'll see hosts and panelists as an option. But if you want to speak to your fellow members, let them know where you are, let them know how you're finding the wines, maybe you're tasting something else this evening, then you need to make sure that you select all in the chat, not just hosts and panellists. So there's a section that says everyone, and that's the most important one if you want to speak to everybody. Um, we've also got a Q&A button. Please do feel free to use that. You'll notice that you can't see your fellow members this evening. So that's just because we're going to have well over 100 people joining today. And as much fun as it is, uh, it can be a little chaotic with too many unmutes. So these are delivered as webinars. But if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A, because Mahesh will manage those throughout the course of the evening. And if you have any thoughts and comments, like I mentioned, then that's what the chat is for. Of course, if you put any questions in there, we won't tell you off. Um, we will pick those up as well, but Mahesh will be helping me behind the scenes to manage those. Hopefully some of you ordered the mixed case for tonight. If you didn't, don't worry, we're going to cover a lot more than just those three wines. And um, it's going to be whistle stop. <laughs> I've allowed an hour and 15 minutes for this session. So if you do need to pop off, don't worry, because it is being recorded on YouTube and you can always catch up later. So uh, all of our online events are recorded. So it does mean that you can watch them afterwards. I will also probably not be able to do as much in-depth stuff as I would like. But what I'll do tomorrow is I will send an email following up and I'll send you to some other links because actually we've done so many events already online, well over 200, that if I mention, for example, Oak, I'm not going to have much time to talk about Oak. If I mention Oak, if you want to learn more about Oak, don't worry, there's a video online already done to, to cover that for you. So the aim of the game today is to have a bit of fun, to learn some basics, and we are going to discuss the three wines. I keep looking side to side because I've spread them out this evening. Uh, so I've got the uh, the Beaujolais and the Rioja is on my left, or I think you're right on your screens. And then we're going to finish with the Bordeaux. I will guide you through them, so don't worry. But the, the main aim of today is to learn how red wine is made really quickly. We're going to do a basic intro to that because we don't need too much technical stuff. What makes red wine red wine? Why is it red? What's the difference between red wine and other, other wine styles? And then we're going to talk about... There's basically two ways you can come at red wine. You can talk about the place. So you can talk about uh, where red wine is made and then dip into the grapes. Or you can do it the other way around and you can talk about grapes and then where they're grown. And I'm going to do the second option. So we're going to cover grape varieties that make some of the world's most famous red wines today. And then we're going to talk about where those are grown. Because I think when you're starting out, it's a little bit easier to remember grapes that you like. And because this is a beginner's guide, I think that's the best way of doing it. Different way, you know, different people suit different things. And certainly ask away if you've got a question, you know, I love the wines of this area, but what, what grape is that? I'll happily answer them. Um, and Mahesh might even type some answers behind the scenes. But uh, the main thing today is that we're going to cover some really, really good foundations, basics, what to expect from certain grapes and where you're going to find them. So I have got some slides, but don't worry, uh, most of them are pictures. <laughs> uh, I don't like to put too much text on slides, mainly because I get distracted. So <laughs> let's start with some basics um, before we go into the, the nitty gritty and the details. What makes red wine red wine? Well, it sounds really simple, but actually red wines can only be made from red grapes. Uh, that being said, red grapes can actually make red wines, white wines, rosés, sparkling wines like champagne. 
Um, so the red grape can do most things. It can't make orange wine, but it can do pretty much everything else. And that is because, and I've put this picture here for good reason, the, the pulp inside all grapes is clear. Every single grape with a few very, very unusual exceptions has that clear pulp. So the juice, the liquid that you're going to get from that is clear. So it looks like a white wine. In theory, you can make a champagne from these grapes here that looks pale and light. And that's because essentially when you're making the wine, you ditch those skins straight away because the color, all of the color in a grape is found in that outside of the berry. So that's what's giving the color to all of your juice. So red wine basically means that we're keeping those skins involved in the production process. And that's really the key. Um, I'll go into the production process in a second, but a tiny bit more on red grapes. The um, I should mention as well, please feel free to start sipping any of the wines. <laughs> Don't wait for me. We're just going to quickly talk about um, basic grape, like the basics of a grape, how red wine's made, and then we'll very quickly go into tasting. But um, feel free to sip along. It's 7.07, so we need, we need a, a beverage on this Thursday night. Um, but yes, yeah, so you only you can only get the colour from the skins. So therefore, white grapes can't give you red colour. Um, you can also find quite a lot of flavour in those skins and also tannins. We're going to talk a bit about what a tannin is um, and what they taste like in the three wines we've got. But if you imagine the main difference other than flavour profile, flavours of red and white are very different. But the main difference um, that most people detect between red and white wines in terms of structure is this drying sensation in the mouth. It's a little bit like drinking cold tea or um, it's like eating I always find the, the stringy bits inside a banana they're full of tannins and actually skin of fruit in general is quite high in that tannin so it can make your tongue feel furry can make the sides of your mouth feel furry sometimes even your teeth that's tannins and that's really crucial to the structure of a lot of red wines and it's a sliding scale some great wines have low tannins some great wines have high tannins um, but that's one thing that you might find gives you a point of reference. Do I prefer high tannin red wines or low tannin red wines? How furry is your mouth getting? Um, and that's one of the other, so that's the other real key difference between reds and whites. Um, so let's crack on to quickly how red wine is made. It's less romantic than you think, but let's tell it as if it's a romantic story. Um, I'll come back onto that slide in just a, in just a moment. Um, so how is red wine made? In the vineyard, it starts, we take those red grapes and what we do is we crush them. When I say crush them, I basically mean something like they used to do here. This doesn't really happen anymore. Unfortunately, they now have, uh, you can have a crusher immediately, a mechanical crusher as your grapes vis um, come into the winery. But traditionally, you would have crushed the grapes like this. So what this gentleman is doing with his feet is he is um, standing on those grapes gently and breaking the skin so that the juice comes out. The main difference here is if we were making a white wine, we would then put it in a press and we would just get the juice. But as you can see here, he is stomping away and he's keeping those skins in contact with the juice. And in a way, red wine always reminds me of making a cup of tea. He's sort of planning, planning on brewing his tea. Um, and here we are brewing the tea some more. This um, is a very common technique used in red wine making. And what they're doing is they're taking the liquid from the bottom and they're pumping it over the top or actually probably more accurate to a cup of tea as a cafe tiers. So they're really, really brewing that coffee and getting those grounds integrated. So here they're really integrating those skins. And that is essential in red wine making because you can do this to a lesser extent. You can do it to a greater extent. And that will hugely affect how your red wine tastes and how it feels inside your mouth. So there's quite a lot of things that you can do. Um, we'll talk a bit about oak and bottle aging in a in a in a moment but essentially this is what happens just to make your basic uh, red wine alcohol <laughs> um so 
I'll quickly tell you about where, where red wine is made, because that's the other factor. And I skipped past that. And then we'll go into tasting and talking about our first wine. Um, this is a bit of a, a, a bit of an odd map, but I think it's really important. Red wine and wine in general used to only really be produced between the 50th and 30th parallel around the world. So whether it's the Southern Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere, that little bracket was where you used to find wine production. And you can still see that the majority is made there. Now, things are changing, climate change and, and uh, also changing techniques in production of wine mean that you can actually grow grapes outside of those. Um, also, if you just grew it in a really, really, really high up mountain where it's cooler, you can you can get closer to the equator. But the best wine production happens in those two areas, uh, within those two bands. The red grapes generally need a little bit more heat. So there are parts of the world that are brilliant at growing white wine and less good at growing red wine. So England is a good example of that. So the UK, but Southern England in particular, very good at white wine, has only just started making good red wine. And actually it sits outside that 3050. So um, red grapes tend to need, because of those skins needing extra maturation, they tend to need slightly warmer areas. So what you'll find is if you get nice sunny places, uh, those tend to be your red wine hotspots. Um, so let's uh, let's say, for example, southern France, Spain, Italy, some of the best red wine in the world is produced in those places. And actually, that's also where particularly France and Spain, the most international grape varieties come from. So a lot of the grapes that we taste from all over the world originated in France and Spain. Italy has an amazing selection of grape varieties, but they're quite indigenous. Most mostly stay within Italy and aren't produced globally. So we won't really talk about those today, but feel free to fire me some questions about your Italian grapes, your Greek grapes, your Portuguese grapes. They're just less well-traveled, so we won't cover them. Um, but the well-traveled grapes, so let's just take, for example, your Cabernet Sauvignon or your Merlot, two very famous grapes. They're grown in the USA, Australia, Chile, Argentina. Those grape varieties originated in that very um, busy, shall we say, area of the map, which is essentially southern and uh, mid and southern European countries. So um, as I mentioned, today we're going to talk about varieties and then we're going to use that as a lens to talk about these different places. So before we kick off, I'm just going to clarify what a variety is so we don't have any confusion. Um, the easiest way, I think, is if we think of a variety of a grape, just like you would a variety of a rose. Now, um, all roses are roses and all grapes are grapes, but there are different characteristics. And all, pretty much all of the wine that we drink in, in most places is made with a species called Vitis vinifera. So let's call that the garden rose. But even within the garden rose, you have some roses with big petals. And I'm not going to recite loads of Latin rose names because I don't know them. But, you know, some are pink, some are white, some have um, some grapes have thicker skins, some have thinner skins. Some roses have big petals, some grapes have high acid. So there is a, it's like a species with lots of different subspecies within it. But fundamentally, there are overall characteristics of, um, you know, you can't plant white roses that have a certain character and expect them to come out purple. Um, so the really interesting thing about a grape variety is if you have, let's take Merlot, which we're going to talk about last, Merlot has a certain character. And if you think about the winemaker and the vigneron as the gardener, they might make it, you know, climb higher or they might make it do something interesting your rose um, but they're never going to be able to change the fundamental DNA of, and the character of that grape so although I'm going to talk in huge generalizations there will always, always be exceptions to the rule varietal, char varietal character is varietal character and hopefully today we're going to go through some really good varieties to to help you understand a bit more um, the key ones should we say so it's quarter past. I think it's time to uh, start having a sip of our Beaujolais. Um, I've got the Beaujolais here. I am going to talk about the place shortly. Um, but on that note, we will explain why it's called Beaujolais. 
Um, and this is always the nastiest bit when you're talking about why, the wild, world of wine. Europe has essentially, um, <laughs> they, they name their wines by the place rather than the grape. So all of the wines we're tasting today are European expressions. You will not find, I don't think, and you probably hold me to this, you will probably not find the grape variety on the label. In some places in Europe, it is illegal to put the grape variety on the label. So when I start talking about a wine and you say, well, I don't understand, that's not on the label anywhere. Oh, I told a lie. They have mentioned in very small print on the Rioja which grape variety it is. So well done. Um, but by and large, uh, you just have to learn them. And it's really tricky. So Rioja is a place but Tempranillo is the grape in that wine. Burgundy is a place, but legally Pinot Noir has to be the grape variety to go into red, red Burgundy. It's cruel, but it's also fun. So it's a really um, good challenge when you're starting to learn about wine. So don't be put off if somebody says a name that you don't recognize and then sort of guffaws that you don't know that place. Um, I'm teaching hopefully the varieties and we'll talk about the places it goes into and I will gladly send you the slides as well and I'm an open book if you need to ask questions even after the sessions but um what I would say is great varieties will help you learn what you like I think better um but the places are often how they will be written when they come from Europe on a wine list but if they're non-European grown, so if they're from Australia, say, or uh, California or um, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, they'll often write the grape variety. And that is just um, we don't really call it old world, new world anymore. But that's a sort of stylistic thing that more uh, recently developed wine countries do. And it's great because it means we know what we're drinking, whereas Europe's a bit of an enigma. So let's start with the lighter wines. We're going to start this evening with a Gamay grape variety. And it's from the region of Beaujolais. Now, I've done this with lots of the grape varieties tonight. Like I said, I will send you them all. Um, I've tried to put some ideas in your head to see what you might taste. Before we, um, before we question bananas, bubblegum and straw for sweet, some Gamay can taste like this, but it's quite specific. Uh, so I will talk about why that is in a moment. Um, but let's just first of all talk about what it looks like. If you've all got, oh, sorry, pardon me, that wasn't what I meant to do. If you've all got the Beaujolais, uh, or if you have a Beaujolais, sorry, the lighting in here is just not working for my, I apologise, there we go. So the Beaujolais is the one I'm going to start with. This is 2021, it's nice and young. Um, if you've got any Beaujolais that you're tasting along with this evening, um, that will work as well. It should be, much like mine is, quite pale in colour. Now, if you are assessing colour, the best thing to do, and I don't have one to hand, is to hold a white piece of paper down. And it means that you can hold your wine glass a little bit like a Dalit, and you can check under, with your piece of paper underneath how pale your wine glass is. Uh, sorry, how pale your wine is in the glass. Um, the next thing you would do is you would swirl the wine. And the reason you see people swirl the wine, it's not to look all fancy and pretentious. It's in order to release the aromas. And this is particularly important, I would say, with um, with your very perfumed wines. So things like Gamay and Pinot Noir are very aromatic. And the pleasure often comes from the nose. Um, so it's very important to um, to really swirl and, and get those aromas going. Um, once you've done your swirl, the next thing is to sniff. And I will put the slide back up for this because I think it's quite nice to have some prompts. If you think, oh, my goodness, I would never have got any of these without the prompts on the screen. Don't worry. That is actually really the hardest bit of wine tasting. A lot of people can can register something they're smelling but might not be able to put it into words. So for me, my immediate smells in this are um, sort of that red currant smell. I've got lots of raspberry, really fresh raspberries. 
I've got something slightly blueberry in here, which I don't have on my page, but um, something ever so slightly blueberry. I've got lots of strawberry. I do have that kind of slightly candied strawberry, but not too much. I don't have the mushroom and the dirt that are on the far side of the screen. But I do have something a little bit floral. I actually don't think it's violets. I put violets on the screen. I don't quite have violets. It's more like a kind of, I don't mean to be mean, but a potpourri, <laughs> a, a kind of like lovely mm, melange of, of um, dried petals almost. But it's quite delicate and it's quite light. If you have uh, been lucky enough to pour all three wines, one thing that's quite fun to do at this stage, we don't have to talk about it yet, but just have a sniff of all of your wines. Because sometimes, um, and Jancis Robinson is amazing for this, but um, very, well, probably the most famous uh, wine critic working today. Um, she always has, whenever you see her at a tasting, she always has two glasses. She will never just taste a wine by itself. Much easier if you're tasting two things side by side to tell the key differences. So if you have got some of your Rioja uh, poured, have a little smell. Should smell markedly different. And then go back to your Beaujolais and see if you can smell something again. You know, what else can you get? So for me now, it went it went far more candied. It went into that very, very strawberry, um, sweetie aroma far far more so than it had before I did the Rioja so that's a good little tip if you um if you fancy it but Gamay as a great variety is uh it's got really light skins and it's actually got a lot in common with Pinot Noir so it's got a pale color because we haven't got much skin to kind of make our our tea or our coffee extraction from so it's got light skins pale color there for um, it's got a lovely high acid. Now, it's not as high acid as Pinot Noir, but still got some freshness. Um, and acid is obviously not something that you're going to be able to uh, distinguish or, or decipher, should I say, just by smelling it. So we do need to taste it. Likewise, tannins as well. Um, so when we're tasting a wine, I'm just going to grab my spittoon. I apologize. When we're tasting a wine, what we want to do is get a nice... Um, easy mouthful don't take too much get a nice easy mouthful in the mouth and swirl it around get enough oxygen in there's one um technique i used to say do do the washing machine and then do the hannibal lecter because you want to get a bit of air um air in your mouth now it's kind of funnier if you're in company um but if you're not don't worry because i'm not either so we'll be doing this together so I hate doing this and it's going to go on a video, but we'll do it on a video. It's fine. So I'm going to swirl it around my mouth, the washing machine first. I'm going to think about where I can feel it in my mouth. Is there any part it's particularly sticking to? And then I'm going to do the, the um, Hannibal Lecter thing. It's very attractive. <laughs> but like I said... Much funnier if you're in a group, um, wear dark clothing <laughs> if it's your first time. Um, so for me, the the tannins are low. It's not too furry. It's my first red wine of the day. So it's always going to feel a little furrier than than uh, had I had, you know, a big, robust red wine with lunch. I've got a tiny, tiny touch of furriness on the tongue, but really not very much. And it's very refreshing. It's making my mouth salivate. So that's the acidity. It's got quite a tart nature to it, I would say. So it's that cranberry, red currant, more of those fruits. I've lost sweet raspberries, but it's almost like underripe raspberries that you've tried to you tried to pick too soon in the garden. Um, it's quite tart and bitter, but really, really refreshing. And actually, mine's slightly chilled, which is lovely. I really like this Beaujolais slightly chilled. Um, so. As I said, similar structure to a great Pinot Noir that we're going to talk about, which is probably, well, it is much more famous. But Beaujolais is grown very close to the heartland of Pinot Noir. And I want to show you where. The grape is Gamay. Remember, the place is Beaujolais. Now, Beaujolais is actually this um, little purple area here. So you've got the red section which is uh, Burgundy, which we're going to mention briefly in a moment, probably one of the most famous wine regions in the world with Chablis up here. 
and then the main part of Burgundy here. But literally connected to it is Beaujolais. Pinot Noir comes from this red region, which they call Burgundy or Red Bourgogne. But Gamay, which is what we're tasting here, is grown in this little purple section. Um, it hasn't really spread anywhere else in the world. And that's why I thought this was a good example just to show at the beginning, because it, it's probably one of the easiest grape equals place. Very rarely do you find a Californian Gamay. They exist, but I think I've tasted one in my whole life. Um, really, when you're talking about the grape Gamay, you don't even really call, I mean, it's not a very pretty name for starters. So you don't really talk about Gamay much. But actually, it's the grape that is so delicious that goes into Beaujolais. It's having a bit of a resurgence at the moment. Um, it's becoming incredibly trendy. Um, and this is if you break Beaujolais down. Now, you might have heard of Beaujolais Nouveau, and I will talk about that in a moment. But these are also quite famous, or some of these are quite famous little sub-regions within Beaujolais. So if you've ever heard of anyone say the name Fleury, uh, which is quite popular. Um, Morgon is also popular. And I would say Moulin Avant, is pro they're probably the ones you hear of the most. Um, Santa Moore sells a lot, unsurprisingly, around Valentine's Day. But Fleury in particular, you see Fleury everywhere on supermarket shelves. So what do we know about that? Well, we know that it's part of Beaujolais, it's within Beaujolais, and we know that Beaujolais is made with the Gamay grape variety. So what we should expect there are these sort of, you know, um, predominantly fruity, bright, nice, um, light body, low tannin wines. Now, there are some more um, Burgundian styles. What I mean by that is there are some people taking Gamay very seriously. And um, there are some richer styles of the Gamay grape variety too. So Moulin Avant is one of them, Juliana is another. So they're not all made equal. And some of them, if we go back to this original slide, are more in that mushroomy, earthy. You can get them when they've had a little bit of age and they can taste almost quite savoury. But the vast majority of Beaujolais that you're going to find sort of at the £10 mark is going to be in this fruit section, really focusing on fruit and particularly red fruit. I said I was going to come back to it and I will mention it now. Beaujolais Nouveau in particular uses a slightly different method of production. And uh, it uses something called carbonic maceration. And carbonic maceration essentially is, instead of that lovely vat of the man treading his feet, you don't do any of that. You put all of your grapes into a big barrel or a big stainless steel vat usually, and they have the stalks on, and you shut the lid. And anaerobically, so without oxygen, what will eventually happen is that the grapes I won't go into the science too much, but the grapes essentially need to produce energy and they ferment. So they produce their alcohol instead of the juice being released and all these lovely yeasts saying yum, 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 sugary juice, yum, 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 uh, which is what essentially is happening when he's treading and eating it and then producing alcohol. What actually happens is you don't need the yeast. The grape almost eats itself and it eats um from the outside in, and it produces this very obvious, distinct aroma, bubblegum, kirsch, sometimes cinnamon, um, sometimes that confected fruit, but not always. Um, so confected fruit can just come from the variety. So that lovely straw, Haribo straw flavor that I adore. Um, but then you've also got uh, that banana aroma. And that comes from this thing called carbonic maceration. Now, full carbonic maceration really is only used in Beaujolais Nouveau which is a totally different style in itself, released very, very, very young in the same November that it was harvested. But some producers, not just in Beaujolais, but in other parts of the world, use a little bit of that technique blended in with more traditional, as we would call traditional, everyday winemaking. So you might find little nuances of it around the world. Um, so it's worth noticing, but it's most famous for this particular style called Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, Julian has said this Beaujolais is lovely, refreshing and fruity and a good example for the price. Um, I think so. I, I think it's a really good, um, a really, really good example. And it does exactly what Gamay in its kind of purest form does. It has the really obvious hallmarks of a Gamay. You'd want this in a blind tasting to say this is a Gamay grape variety. Um, it's made for us by Negociant. And 100% uh, Gamay, obviously. 
it's fresh, bright, fruity, light bodied. It's not hugely intense. Um, and I think for me, it's a really nice wine to have um, in the summer if you're having it slightly chilled or with um, with a, a, a lighter cheese board, not too heavy cheese board. It's lovely. Uh, if you were in Beaujolais, you'd probably eat it with saucisson or even proper sausages, um, regional sausages, which would be delicious. A Beaujolais and sausages is just yeah. Um, do feel free to comment on on the wines you're tasting, Julian. Thank you for your note. I love reading them and I love hearing what you think. So please, please do. Right. I've mentioned Pinot Noir already and we're going to talk about it quickly because it is probably the most admired. It's probably not the right word. Um, grape in the world. And it comes from Burgundy. And the reason we didn't put one on this evening is um, they're very expensive. It's often described as being quite fickle. The problem with Pinot Noir is similar structure to Gamay. Doesn't like the same soils for starters. So it likes quite light limestone soils. Gamay doesn't. It can grow in granite beautifully. Um, doesn't like when there's too much water. Doesn't like when there's too little water. Doesn't like when there's too much heat. Doesn't like too little heat. So it's the Goldilocks grape, basically. <laughs> Um, so, oh, sorry, I forgot to put the sign up for the Beaujolais. That was the Beaujolais we just tasted. Um, you'll see, though, and I've intentionally kept them in a similar layout. A lot of the flavour profile of Pinot Noir is actually very similar. The thin skins still make it a pale wine. Lots and lots of flavours, way more than, the, than are on this slide, uh, can happen. I think what probably makes it slightly more interesting for most people is that it can really develop and become very complex with some smoky character, soil, truffle, mushroom, clove and star anise I get. Um, particularly in wines from Australia, I get this incredible Chinese five spice on Pinot Noir, which is just amazing. Um, and my favorite is some old burgundy can smell like streaky bacon. It's an acquired taste. Not everybody likes that. I personally love it. Um, but as I mentioned, it's it's fickle. It therefore tends to be quite an expensive grape. And because it started life expensive, uh, a lot of people continue to sort of hike up the price. It's also a grape that if you really, you know, pump it full of water in the vineyard becomes unbelievably boring very quickly. So you need to almost... Um, produce less of it to make it better. So therefore the prices go up. Um, Burgundy is here, I've already mentioned. So Burgundy is probably most, well, it is the most famous place and it's also where it started. Some of the most expensive wines in the world are produced here. I believe Domaine de la Romani Conti is still the most expensive wine in the world. That is 100% Pinot Noir from Burgundy. And much like Beaujolais, it also has lots of smaller uh, appellations within it, but it's actually a lot harder to master. Beaujolais has 10. Burgundy, I can't even think how many, but Burgundy has now off the top of my head. Um, there are Premier Crews, Grand Crews, different villages. There's Cote d'Or. Um, you know, there's, there's sections within Burgundy and then sections within that. So uh, they often say that Burgundy is the most addictive region to learn about because you can never stop learning about Burgundy. I think it's what makes it a bit of a collector's item as well. Other notable places where Pinot Noir is grown, and I will mention it, there's a lot grown in southern France that's really uninspiring. There are a couple of good wines, but really uninspiring overall. Um, going back to our map of the... I've, I'm sorry this looks so horrible, but I've intentionally made the stars look a bit warped um, because I wanted to, to call out a few places, but I wanted to be reflective of where. So England is now growing Pinot Noir for sparkling wine, but also for still red wine. Not in huge amounts, but enough. Uh, it's too hot when you start getting down to Spain. So we're really focusing more in France and also Germany, where it's called Spätburgunder. You do find some in Romania and places like that and often quite good value wines. I know we often stock some at the Wine Society. If we're going down into the Southern Hemisphere, starting with New Zealand, some really nice New Zealand um, Pinots, unbelievable quality, quite expensive, but very good. Australia, you need cool pot spots in Australia because it is a bit warmer. So places like Mornington Peninsula are amazing. South Africa, the same story. You need the cool spots. So in South Africa, you've only got a couple of places making good stuff. Uh, regions like Elgin. 
Now here, this is why the star looks a bit drunk. Um, you do get some amazing Pinot Noir from Chile, but it usually tends to be coastal because you need to have that cooling influence. And the story is the same if you go up on the Northern Hemisphere, you need that coastal influence. So Sonoma is very famous. I think I've put another slide in, yeah. Sonoma is a very famous part of California, but the most famous part wine producing region for quality I would argue, I think most people would say the same, in the world other than Burgundy is Oregon. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that the growing conditions are very, very similar to Burgundy. And therefore, Oregon is the place other than Burgundy that really has a, a, put its stamp, should we say, on the Pinot Noir grape. But my goodness, they're not cheap. So um, <clears throat> if your pockets are full and you like light wines, Pinot Noir is the grape for you. If your pockets are not so full and you like light wines, then Gamay is probably the grape for you. And I think there's a perfectly good place for both of them. So let's move on. <clears throat> Pardon me. We're going to talk about Grenache. We're not tasting a Grenache. Um, but I would say it's probably the trend, one of the trendiest, if not the trendiest grape in the world right now. Um, and you will, if you like red wine, have tasted a Grenache before. I feel bad saying the name because actually it's now believed to be origins in Spain, which, where it's called Garnacha. And um, I won't show you a map. You know where Spain is. <laughs> uh, so very traditional Spanish wines are made from Garnacha and it is a blending partner in some Riojas, in lots of Riojas, to be honest with you, but just not the one we're tasting today. Um, it's also the one of the one of the two most famous wines of the Southern Rhone. So there are two great varieties that are very popular in the Southern Rhone, but Grenache is the dominant one. So if you have had a Cote de Rhone, if you've had a Chateau Neuf de Pâques, you will have had Grenache, the great variety. Um, it's, I'll just show you the flavours. You'll notice there are some similarities, which is why I put it at this point in the um, presentation. Again, it has quite thin skins, not as thin as the other two. And the acidity is not as high. It can also get very alcoholic. So you need to be quite careful, which is why it can often taste like fruitcake in a nice way, but if that gets too much, it can end up being quite jammy. One of the really interesting things about Grenache, depending on how you make it, is sometimes it can taste like orange peel, which is probably one of its more unusual characters. But dominant flavors, I would say, are white pepper and strawberry. And those are the two things that if you can really get a strawberry and white pepper character, you should be thinking this might have some Grenache in it. Similar to your Pinot, when it ages, it can go like truffles. This on the right here is tobacco leaf. Cinnamon and licorice are quite common. This is licorice root here, which I always get um, a little of in, in the slightly um, more farm, farm-esque, less polished, more, I don't like the word rustic, let's not use it, less polished Southern Rhones, um, which is where my family are from, I get this lovely licorice root. It's not like candied licorice at all, it's really rooty. Um, and then the light wines, you can start to get really floral things. Grenache makes amazing um, rosé. It's not actually travelled as far as you'd think. So even though it arguably makes two of the most expen uh, expensive, famous wines in the world, Rioja and Chateauneuf de Pape or, or other Southern Rhones, it actually hasn't travelled that far. So there's a little bit in West, um, South, Southern Australia. Um, but other than that, it's, it's catching on. There's a bit coming through Chile, but it's very trendy at the moment because when it's made in the light style, this sort of left part of your screen, actually got quite a lot in common with Pinot Noir but it can grow in much warmer places so a lot of people experimenting with it thinking hmm this might be the new Pinot Noir. So I mentioned the grape already that it blends really beautifully beautifully within the southern Rhone and this is the grape of the northern Rhone so if I just show you here the northern Rhone is here and the southern Rhone is this big fat pink splodge underneath it and uh the north is famous for Syrah. The south is famous for Grenache, but you can blend. Now, this slide can look more different to the slides we've looked at so far. Syrah is all about black fruits. Um, it's also the same as Shiraz, if you're, you're um, wondering. Here, there's loads of stuff going on because, to be honest, Syrah is just the most 
bizarre, incredible grape of all time. It can taste like olives, tapenade, black pepper, very black peppery sometimes, um, hoisin sauce. Um, a lot of it takes oak very well. So a lot of these qualities are oak influenced, things like your um, your vanilla pods, um, for example. But it can also taste like meat, raw meat sometimes. It can taste like uh, rosemary. It can taste like violets. Um, it's made in lots and lots of different ways around the world. And sometimes as a blending partner, like I said, but often not by itself. So the most famous wines of the Northern Rhone, which are usually 100% Syrah, are things like your Hermitage. Um, uh, and you've got very, yeah, various Northern Rhone appellations, but very different in style to things like your Australian Shiraz your Barossa Shiraz, which is a region within Southern Australia. So can make a huge amount of different styles, but it's worth mentioning. We're not tasting one, but um, it's enjoyable. Uh, so let's move on to, oh, sorry, I did put where Syrah's grown as well. I'd forgotten I'd done that. Too organised. So Australia is the big one. Um, and then obviously France, and as I mentioned uh, with Grenache, but I should have mentioned it here as well. Syrah is popular in Argentina and Chile. Um, more so in Chile, less so in Argentina, but that's because they got their own thing going on. Uh, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, don't worry, we're, we're rattling through the grape variety as well. So um, the reason I wanted to show you Grenache and Syrah first is because Grenache is often such a beautiful blending partner with this great variety. And I think Grenache and Tempranillo actually have a lot more in common. What's interesting about Rioja is they blend some great varieties that have a lot more similarities. Tempranillo can be made in a huge amount of styles, the grape we've got in this glass here. But um, in, in the Southern Rome, where they make their Cote de Rhone, Chateauneuf de Paps, Gigondas, et cetera, Grenache and Rioja, uh, Grenache and Mallorca. Grenache and Syrah are so different. Syrah is the black fruited one and Grenache is the red fruited one usually. Tempranillo, which is, is the, um, the Glorioso wine we've got, is 100% Tempranillo. It is the calling card of Rioja, but Grenache is involved in a lot of the wines. It's easier for me to talk about grape varieties when we're showing 100%, which is why I picked 100% Tempranillo. But just bear it in mind, um, you're probably going to find Grenache in most of your Riocas these days in particular. And it's a, it is a really good blending partner. So this is an unusual wine in that it's 100% Tempranillo. Um, on our list tonight, Tempranillo is the least travelled variety. But since Rioja is one of the most popular and famous wines in the world, it felt really silly to not include it. Um, again, it is a Spanish variety. Um, and if you were to put a point of difference between it and Grenache, the fruit is a bit darker than Grenache. And it's also a bit more fresh. There's more acidity than Grenache. I mentioned earlier that was a bit lower in acid. Um, so what sort of flavours? We've got some of that star anise coming back. I think fig is often one that I get in, in Tempranillo, which I love. It can be very herbaceous. And I think that's gorgeous. Um, the other thing is that Spanish Tempranillo in particular can have some oak influence. And they, the Spanish don't shy away from allowing you to taste the oak a lot, which is gorgeous and why Rioja can be so friendly. So some of the flavors on the right here are flavors or aromas that you might get from um, Tempranillo uh, when it's had oak. So cinnamon, you might get coffee, you might get mocha, chocolate, actual wood flavors, leather sometimes when it's had a bit of age. This, to me, is unbelievably complex um, for the price. I Still, it blows my mind how they can sell Rioja at these sorts of prices. Um, it's, it's uh, I'll just quickly show you where Rioja is. La Rioja here is this orange section, so it's quite, um, it's quite mountainous, quite high up. It's in northern Spain. So it has this lovely freshness. The fruit doesn't smell too jammy here. It's quite fresh. I've got black and red fruits. I've got um, a little bit of that kind of sweet spice, maybe some vanilla, some some vanilla pods, some cinnamon. This has had a um, hundred percent French oak barrels for ten months, but they weren't brand new. Um, it's really 
it's got this lovely almost like current jam aroma to it but it doesn't smell jammy and that often people think well that's a bad word I don't mean it like that at all it's it's got this kind of um really indulgent nose to it um let me know what you think and I'm gonna have a taste Mm. Mm. ah so here we've started to feel tannins properly I've got them on the roof of my mouth but they're being washed away by this high acidity so my mouth's watering whenever I present and I've got a lovely high acid wine I I get a bit embarrassed because I think I'm going to dribble um it's really really making me salivate but there is this kind of grip and this thing that makes me want to put it with food I want to have it with my manchego or my tapas right now um in terms of the flavor it's much more intense than the wine before and it's not just fruit the wine we had before was a young wine it hadn't seen any age and it hadn't seen any oak now we're moving on to a wine that is a bit older and not only has it had oak aging, it's had aging in the bottle. So I will quickly mention what those two things do. Oak, like I said, I've got a whole video on it. I will send it around. But oak does two things. It massages the wine and softens those tannins by giving it a little bit of oxygen. And it imparts the flavour. We've got a bit of both here. So those tannins are slightly softened. They're not too grainy. They, they have been softened. But also we have got those aromas on the nose that we picked up, particularly like the wood and the vanilla coming from the oak. The aging in the bottle, often when you say a wine is aged, you can mean it's aged in oak. But we are, when we're specifically talking about wines that age in the bottle, not all wines are born equal to age. Now, by and large, red wines age better than white. And that's because of those tannins. There are exceptions to the rule. Pinot Noir ages quite well with low tannins, but most grapes have to have good amount of structure to age. And the older the wine gets, the less like fruit it tastes. Now, some people don't like that, and that's absolutely fine. It will probably save you some money in the long run. Um, but as it ages, the wines transition. So you kind of go from fruity, sometimes to dried fruits. So maybe a bit of dried fig in here. And then we move on to those savoury characters. I've already mentioned things like bacon fat and mushrooms on the Pinot Noir. Um, in Rioja here, I am getting a kind of like herbaceous, savoury thing. Bordeaux, our final wine, which is a is a, a sort of everyday drinking Bordeaux, so I wouldn't age it too much. But the finest Bordeaux in the world, those will end up smelling like wet leaves eventually, which some people absolutely love. Svetlana said a strong strong taste of tobacco. I totally agree. It's got that kind of like herby tobacco slightly smoky smoke is something that often comes through on smoke aging as well much more savory much much richer um i think that's a great point svetlana yeah definitely some definitely some tobacco on this one so let me know what you thought that i've picked two very different wines to start of individual grape varieties so hopefully those have um given you some food for thought please go back to your Beaujolais and then come back to the Rioja and vice versa um because I think that's a really good way of just going oh okay do I like tannins do I prefer low tannins do I like young fruity wines do I prefer wines that are a little bit older that have some more of that savory character um so they're a good side-by-side -side comparison and now what we're going to talk about is probably the most famous wine in the world, which is Red Bordeaux, but a wine that is blended. Now, this one, I've actually picked one that's not blended on purpose because we're talking about varieties. I have picked a, well, that's not true. Sorry, it's not that it's not blended. It's that it's so hugely Merlot majority. We're not going to pick up much else, but it's, it is blended. That was an unfair thing to say. Um, Merlot. Merlot is a... Um, a wonderful variety that gets a really hard time. Merlot is the, the, the champion of being medium. It's medium tannins, medium acidity, medium body, medium alcohol. This one's actually 14%, so I'd argue it's not quite medium. But it, it's one of the reasons that Merlot wines are so popular is they're often just unbelievably inoffensive, but the great ones are fantastic. And uh, it just makes, I think, Merlot is probably the best quaffing wine in the world. You can see here, it still can have loads of fruit character. Just because it's friendly doesn't mean it's boring. 
Um, I've put cassis in here, but take that with a pinch of salt because the cassis can often come with the blending partners rather than the wine. But and we'll go on to that when we talk about Cabernet. But we've got um, red and black cherries. We've got plums. Everybody always says Merlot is plum. Merlot is plum. Uh, some herbs. We can get this kind of cedar box. We can get all sorts of those kind of aromas. When it takes oak, it can go coconut, chocolate. Chocolate for me is often a good sign of a good Merlot. It's very indulgent on the oak. Um, I should have mentioned coconut on Tempranillo, actually. Shame on me for not mentioning that. It often can be very coconutty, and uh, that can mean there's some American oak in there. Um, lots and lots of things. And the heartland of Merlot is in Bordeaux. And Bordeaux is this light green area, not the dark green, which is sort of the southwesterly parts of France, but the light green area where I've whacked a great big star over the top. And just to zoom in on Bordeaux, this is where Merlot is grown. But, and a big but, it specializes on this right side of the river. There are two very different soil types in, in Bordeaux. On the right side, there is a clay, and on the left side, there is a gravel. That's very basic, but fundamental. You, could, you can't go wrong with those two statements. There are nuances, of course, but if you just imagine right is clay, so all of these big bits here are clay, left is gravel. And because of that, very different grape varieties thrive. So on the right-hand side of the river, and in this middle section here, because there's actually two rivers joining um, here. So we've got two estuaries that join at this point here. On the right side and in the middle, that's where your clay is, and that's where you're going to find your Merlot dominant wines. I mentioned that Bordeaux like to blend. On the left side, you're going to find your Cabernet dominant wines. So hold that in your mind whilst we're talking about Merlot, and then I'll re-show you the map when we start talking about Cabernet. But Merlot is a true international variety. Um, it's grown everywhere. It's worth mentioning a few of the names. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'll just go back to, to Bordeaux, actually, because the two most famous places on the right bank of Bordeaux are Pomerol and saint -Emilion. And they are very famous. And people that say, um, people that say uh, Merlot can't make exciting wines, one of the first growths, um, of the right bank of Bordeaux, their wines sell for hundreds and hundreds of pounds a bottle, sometimes a thousand pounds a bottle. So Pomerol and saint Emilion are the two names that you would probably know. But it is international. And when I say it's international, you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, I'm having an Italian Merlot on the regular, but you might have heard of the Super Tuscans, which are Tuscan wines where they blended in French varieties to go with the Italians. Now, that you might recognise. Um, it's popular all over France. The north is too cold, so it doesn't really grow up there, but all around the south. In the south, they can make this ridiculously cheap and cheerful wine, but they can also make absolutely stonking wine that is, you know, blows other local varieties out of the water. Merlot can be all things to all people. That's the thing. You have to treat it with some good care and attention. Um, and... It's probably most famous, so grown all over Europe, and I really do mean that, um, but you just might not see it in the label. It's probably most famous in um, other countries, particularly in Washington, when we talk about North America. It's very, very well um, received there and really fantastic. Chile, Chile and Merlot is popular. It's affordable. It's really good quality. It's the sort of wine that, you know, 10 years ago, you could easily buy for under, under five pounds and you'd know you'd be getting good stuff. Um, it's declining in California because of a film called Sideways, or it did decline, I should say. Um, but Cabernet and Pinot Noir took over. Um, so it's less so in, in California, but definitely in Washington. There's a little bit of varietal in New Zealand, a little bit. And by that, I mean 100% Merlot. But really in South Africa, in um, Australia, in sometimes Argentina, Chile, and definitely also in, in New Zealand. So all on that Southern Hemisphere, it's a really popular blending partner with Cabernet Sauvignon. So they make what they call Bordeaux blends. So they take the idea of Bordeaux, which is blending those two grapes and sometimes some others like Cabernet Franc, uh, Malbec sometimes even, which is a grape of Bordeaux. We'll mention it at the end. Um, and what they do is they blend them together and produce, they call it a Bordeaux blend, or they might say Cabernet Merlot blend. 
So they recognize that it's a good blending partner. There's a theory that Cabernet Sauvignon is like a donut in your mouth. Um, we'll go on to that in a minute. Um, and Merlot fills that middle gap because Cabernet Sauvignon can be quite austere and structured. And Merlot is so juicy and fruity and plummy that it kind of fills, fills the center of the donut. And that's a lovely expression. I personally can't imagine that in my mouth, but I know what they're trying to say. Um, it's, it's almost, you know, the sum of its parts are, are greater. So, oh, let me just go back. I've, oh, I've shown you where Washington is, if you were interested. I mean, Washington State, not Washington, D.C. That should be clarified. Don't even grow ground wine in Washington, D.C. So let's go on to this wine, because um, I've got the 2019. Now, I know the 2020 is now for sale. So if you've got the 20, let me know what you think as well. But I've got the 19. They will last a little bit. This is produced by uh, um, Chateau, Chateau de Pitre on the right bank. They don't have any Cabernet Sauvignon growing, to my knowledge. They blend their Merlot with Cabernet Franc, which is more common in that on that right side, uh, which is a, a sibling. They're all related in Bordeaux. Um, I don't mean the people. <laughs> um, all of the grapes are related in Bordeaux. Um, they're all siblings or parents of and mutations of. So there are some really common similarities, but there are some key, key differences, which is why, um, why they taste so good. Um, but you'll see here, this says drink to 2027. Now, I can't remember the price of this. Mahesh might have to help me, but I think it's around the £10 mark. £10 wine that can drink for another five years is quite astonishing. Um, and that is a testament to the ageing potential of Merlot. A lot of people think that Cabernet Sauvignon is the best for ageing, but Merlot actually can age really, really well as well. So don't dismiss it. There are some famous wines like Duckhorn in, in California that are so good. Uh, Napa Valley Merlots. I wish they grew all Merlot in Napa Valley. Um, these wines are beautiful. Um, but this is just a classic right bank style of wine and a reason one of it is one of our best sellers at the Wine Society. So let's go back to our Merlot slide to just have a look whilst we taste. I think really for me, what you're going to hope for here is that plum character. I'm getting a little bit of spice, a bit of pepper. Oh, it's 9.95. There we go. And we are on the 2020 vintage. Thank you. Um, we've had a good question from David whilst I just mentioned the, the pepper. Um, he said he finds that some wines leave a sensation of pepperiness or piquancy in my mouth. Is this what people mean when they say Syrah tastes of pepper? Or is it something to do with the structural components like tannin, acidity, etc.? David, that is such a fantastic question. Um, so Syrah actually has a shared chemical compound with black pepper and Grenache has a shared chemical compound with white pepper. Um, Syrah is more robust and the name escapes me and this is my MW revision falling out of my head. Oh, someone might have to remind me in the chat. I bet someone will remember before I do. Um, but the compound within Syrah that smells like black pepper is different to the sensation in your mouth. It's an aroma compound. So when you say that you get a peppery sensation, probably that's actually a reaction to the alcohol. So alcohol can have this sort of peppery heat to it. And it's very interesting that you say that it's a um, not everybody experiences that, David. So it's quite nice that you do. Um, but the aromas of pepper and the flavor in your mouth are different, if that makes sense. So there's a sensation of fire burning that pepperiness. That's usually to do with the alcohol. Sometimes it can be to do with tannins, but very rarely um, you're going to be really looking at alcohol on that. The smell, as I had the black pepper pile on Syrah very dominantly, is, um, I'm sure it begins with R T rotundan. Someone will correct me. Um, that is an aroma compound. So they're two slightly different things. Um, and you can sometimes smell it and not experience it on the palate. Sometimes you can't smell it, but you feel it on the palate. What I would say is that pepperiness can be manipulated by the winemaker as well. So you can have a yeast that uh, draws out a more peppery aroma. You can uh, include stems, which is going into a bit of detail. But when you put your wine into the vat uh, to, to do your foot stomping, that's now not done by feet and crush it, you might have left your stems in there. And sometimes they can give a peppery sensation into the wines. Um, 
which also can add to it. So it could be a few things is the answer to that, but the aroma and the flavor are not the same. Um, right, so Merlot, what have we got here? I've got a little bit of wood and that's a, a perfectly normal thing to have with Merlot. Sometimes I get a cigar box, which is at the bottom here, and that's basically wood plus um, wood, uh, wood plus tobacco, but sweet tobacco equals cigar box for me. If you ever go, what on earth are they talking about when they say cigar box? Um, that's kind of, uh, it's, um, it's wine language that is ludicrous when you first get into wine and you think, what on earth are they talking about? Pencil shavings. <laughs> what? Wet leaves? saddles <laughs> uh, it's one of those but what we've got here is is less it's it's a little bit just just woody for me rather than that cigar box um but now you know <laughs> red fruits yes black fruits yes it's got a bit of sweet spice for me here touch of vanilla I didn't I couldn't get the exact I'm trying to quiz Tim Sykes our buyer for the exact uh quantities that were put into barrel it's definitely had something done to it in a barrel because it's got that lovely sweet spice um and like I said no Cabernet Sauvignon majority Merlot with a dash of Cab Franc and that Cab Franc we haven't got it on here because it's not as um commonly used grape around the world or at least sold a um, bit of a mon minority player in this game, but my goodness, it's a good uh, a good addition to the Merlots. It adds that peppery aroma, Cabernet Franc, but it also adds a slightly herbal thing, I think, which is great. So let's have a taste. Mm. Mm. Now here we're really talking about tannins, much like the last wine, but the tannins here for me are slightly different. My Tempranillo tannins were quite tight. Sorry, I've forgotten I've got that up. My Tempranillo tannins were quite tight. They were quite dense. Um, they were very much at the fore. I mentioned that Merlot was the middle. These aren't as high. They're more medium tannins. Um, and the acidity is not as high either. So it's more medium. But what I've also got are the tannins are slightly softer. And this sounds stupid but I'm going to have to use the words that I've got coming to me to describe it. it. It feels a bit chubbier. It feels kind of like a big friendly cuddle monster. And I think that's really Merlot's, Merlot's objective in life is to give you a bit of a cuddle. Chardonnay and Merlot, the two cuddliest grape varieties. Um, so, yeah, I think, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a, um, a friendly wine. I think for me, there's a bit of savoury coming through. I'd like to see what happens to it in a couple of years, because I think at the moment it's, it, someone said, great description, cuddly. Um, don't know if you'll find it on the back of the bottle, but if it helps you understand the wine a bit, then there we go. Um, for me, this is kind of in the middle of its life. So we've we, we've lost a bit of fruit on the palate. It's not fruity and juicy anymore. It's got that woody character. And I think what's about to happen is it's about to go into some nice dried fruits as well. So for me, this wine is lovely. I think if you're drinking the 2020, it'll probably be fruitier than mine. And I think if you're drinking the 2019, um, imagine it with some food, some salty food that will bring out the character of the fruit. But I also think this will age. We can have a couple more years of this and it will really, really get something exciting going. Um, so... I feel conscious of time because I did say I'd do some questions at the end. So let's move on to Cabernet because um, it's my penultimate variety of the day. Um, oh, I have got the 2020 on there. Gosh, I'm so organised sometimes I forget. <laughs> uh, so the 2020 is on there. And what year did we say that's going to? That is going to. Oh, it doesn't say how strange. Probably the similar. Um the thing about the Society's Cut to Bordeaux is we try and make it in a very consistent style. So the only thing that will be hugely different year on year, the nice thing about Bordeaux is you can blend and make sure that you are keeping consistency. The main thing that will be different is it'll just be younger. So it'll taste a bit fruitier. So let's go on to Cabernet. You'll notice some, some similar contenders from our last slide. Um, but I have added a few. I've increased the size on a few as well to make things crystal clear. 
One key thing about Cabernet that not many other grape varieties have is this little section, this trio of things up here. Can be quite menthol, which is not the most common thing in red wines, particularly in certain parts of the world. Um, so Australia is very common for having a more menthol style of Cabernet. Uh, sometimes Napa Valley can be more menthol too. It can have a strong flavour of cassis. Now, I obviously couldn't find a cassis picture, so you are having to deal with cassis ice cream scoop there. <laughs> um, but it is that very, very intense, almost liqueured black currant to the point where genuinely sometimes it tastes like alcoholic Ribena. And that's a bad Cabernet in my mind because it's not very complex. But if you've got a touch of it, it's delicious. Um, and then this thing up here. We've spoken about Syrah sharing common indicators with black pepper. One of the things that Cabernet has is green peppers or capsicum, as they're often called, uh, to avoid confusion. And usually that's when the Cabernet hasn't ripened fully. Now, Cabernet Sauvignon is probably considered the finest red grape in the world. Like Merlot originated from Bordeaux, but my goodness, it is everywhere. Um, it, it's it's most famous for this left bank. Bear with me, sorry. I should have put another map in. It's most famous for this left bank here, which we call the Medoc. And there are some of the most famous appellations dominated by Cabernet. When I say dominated, you're going to find about 75% as standard, but sometimes higher. Uh, sometimes lower, depending on the vintage, but 75% would be like a good finger in the air guess on how much Cabernet Sauvignon goes into these left bank wines and some of the most famous appellations in the world. So Margot, Pouillac, Saint-Julien, saint Steph. Um, so very, very famous sounding. Um, and you also get your super, super famous wines like Chateau Mouton, North Shield and, and all of those jazzy, far too expensive wines that I can't afford. Um, but it also grows everywhere in the world. So you will find it in most famously Napa Valley in California, where it makes, again, very expensive red wines. Um, Australia, New Zealand, it's colder in New Zealand, but there is a place called Gimlet Gravels, which does very good stuff. But because it is that slightly colder area, you might find in colder years that you get this green pepper character. You will find it in Chile, Argentina, Uruguay. They all do it, uh, particularly the South American countries. Cabernet will range from super cheap to very expensive. Um, and so there's a lot of vari variation going on there. Um, it is unbelievably famous. And the way I would describe it is where Syrah had the black fruits, the structure, the high tannins, high acid, and then Grenache was your sort of juicy accompaniment to make the wines of the Southern Rhone. Very similar happens in Bordeaux right bank. You've got, well, there's more of the dark, dark fruits, but you have your, your intense Cabernet with high acid, high, well, high-ish alcohol, same as Merlot, but high acid, high tannins, lots and lots of structure. And then your Merlot comes to give it its cuddle and sort of ease it up a bit. So it's the more austere of the two, for sure. Um, but the most famous and well-traveled as well, and certainly the most expensive. In terms of ageability, it probably ages better than any other grape, give or take. Um, there's a couple of Italians that I'd throw into the mix there. But in terms of world-famous wines that are grown, or grapes that are grown everywhere, Cabernet is your long-lived one. That's the wine that you can keep in your cellar for 50 years if you've got a good bottle, and it will be incredible. Uh, and that's why I put also some things that happen when it ages. So um, I actually didn't, silly, silly me. Oh, I did, sorry. We've got smoke. We've got way more than I could even put on here. Leather, you've got earth, you've got wet leaves, you've got forest floor. You can sometimes get truffle. You name it, you can probably find it in an old bottle of Cabernet. Um, so let's just sip the Merlot as we uh, sip the Merlot as we go through to talk about our final wine, because I thought I had to mention it. Where would a red wine tasting be without talking a little about Malbec? Um, Argentina made it famous, but it is actually also from Southwest France and from the Bordeaux region. But a lot of the, um, it is sometimes called Malbec there, or in some places called Co, spelled C-O-T. Um, it was made famous 
by Argentinians because it essentially died in a frost in the in the 1950s in the southwest of France. And I mentioned that grapes need certain places to thrive. And a lot of people said, well, look, it's survived, but has it thrived? And a lot of people went out to Argentina with it. And it has thrived in Argentina. It loves the sunshine. So even though they grow at altitude in Mendoza, I think I, I, oh, sorry, this is Cabernet slide, shame on me. <laughs> so it's actually from this part of France here, Caen or Malbec. And Argentina uh, does sit within the 3050. So it's, it's not um, abnormal, should we say, but it's very sunny, but they grow it in Mendoza at altitude. So it gets the freshness from the altitude, but it also gets the sunshine. And it's not very well traveled. You can see here, I've put one star on France and one star in Argentina. Feels like a bit of a shame, but because Argentina's made it such a calling card, it's quite hard for anyone to compete, I think. In terms of flavor, it's very, very black fruited. For me, the beauty of, um, a good Malbec is all of these black and blue fruits and then sometimes this hint of raspberry, which is really appealing. Um, and the other thing about Malbec is the tannins can be very soft. And even though they're often uh, high, they're never as high and austere as Syrah or, or, um, or Cabernet Sauvignon. So they're sort of friend, it can be a bit friendlier, but really fine Malbec can go from raisined right through to the saddle, almost sweaty, horsey in a good way, um, quite savoury, quite um, intense, should we say, um, and not your everyday drinking wine. And I know there are loads of Malbecs around that are so easy to drink. But one thing I would say is if you've not tried fine wine Malbecs, then you're not living, in my opinion. So <laughs> please, please, please pick up a bottle. Um, there are plenty on our website. About £15 will get you a Malbec that will really knock your socks off. And it felt on me like I had to include Malbec at the end of this presentation. So I've covered all the great varieties. <laughs> on me. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A that I haven't already covered, so I'll quickly cover those. Um, Graham's asked, I know this web webinar is about red wine, but following on from what you said, is the skin of white grapes used in winemaking for some or all of white wines? It's a really good question, Graham. I mentioned really quickly at the beginning that the only wine that red grapes can't make is orange wine. The reason is orange wine is taking white grapes and leaving them with the skins. Almost all wines, <coughs> pardon me, almost all wines that are made from white grapes get rid of the squint, squints, <laughs> skins immediately because they don't want the tannins. Orange wine, if you've ever tried it, has a touch more colour. So you might have heard it called amber wines because they are extracting a bit of colour from the skins. There is some colour. It's not clear. There's still a, a colour to it, but it's also extracting tannins. So that is how orange wine is made. And that's an excellent question. Um, I've also just seen a question pop up from Mary Jane, who said most of the maps have included wines from China. What are they like and can we buy them? Mahesh has answered um, about our buyers tasting Chinese wines regularly and to date not being able to find anything that's tickled their pickle. Um, they, the Chinese are growing a lot of red grapes and, they, and we believe um, they don't share a huge amount of data, but the Bordeaux varieties at the top. So your um, Cabernet Sauvignons, your Merlots, they're the top wines that they're growing. And some there is some good quality, but it's not making its way outside of China. And there are some producers, particularly Bordeaux producers, who've actually invested in China. So watch the space. It might happen, but I don't see it you know, blowing up anytime soon. Um, it's mainly for domestic consumption. Um, somebody has asked, are there any insights on impacts of relative alcohol percentages? Now, I can only assume you mean sort of climate wise. And um, the one thing I should mention is, uh, uh, to reiterate is that different grapes have different qualities and some will naturally get high alcohol so Grenache is one of those and some will never get to a high alcohol Cabernet Franc for example can get high alcohol when grown in South Africa but but more often when it's grown in somewhere like the Loire won't reach so they'll always have a range of alcohols that they can they can get to when it won't taste rubbish uh low and high 
But what I would say is that um, one of the biggest things about climate change is that they're having to rethink where to grow certain grape varieties. So um, grapes that like the warmth are doing well in places that are getting warmer naturally. But I mentioned Pinot Noir obviously is um, doing well in the UK now that we're having these longer, warmer summers on average. The impact of that on alcohol percentages is more sunshine equals more sugar in a grape which equals more alcohol at the end of fermentation. So if we were to stick with everything as is, you would be drinking Chateauneuf de Pape at 16% every time. The reality is we won't stick with everything as it is. Winemakers are already changing the grapes they grow. They're already changing how they grow them because actually you can, I mentioned earlier, the gardener being able to manipulate how he grows his roses. The gardener or the vigneron can slightly manipulate how the vine behaves to create those sugars can basically slow or stunt the production of those sugars during photosynthesis and in doing that they can actually reduce the alcohol so at the moment there's a lot of experimentation going on because we're really on the precipice of those those alcohol percentages increasing i hope that answers your question anonymous um i apologize if not um and another question of linking oakiness to a furry sensation in the mouth, are they the same or different ways of describing the same quality? Oakiness doesn't necessarily mean that you can feel it in the mouth. Tannin is the thing that you can always feel in the mouth. So the tannin usually comes from the skin of the grape. You can, and I don't want to confuse anyone, but you can extract a bit of tannin from oak barrels. But the majority of the tannin that you're going to feel in your mouth, that fur, is from the grape skins. What you tend to feel in the mouth from oak is actually more of a softening sensation. So you'll find that the tannins are actually softened. They get the massage. I don't know why I'm doing this action. Get the massage, get a bit of oxygen in there from the oak, and that actually tends to soften the tannins. So whilst you can extract a little bit of a furry sensation from oak, it's really not something you can pick on, pick up on very easily. You're much more likely to get the furry sensation from the tannins in the skins. And then last but not least, a question very dear to my own heart, because we've run two minutes over, so I apologise. Uh, Peter has asked, what about Pinot Noir from the Loire Valley? It's a good question, um, Peter. Now, it actually links back to what I was just saying. I think Pinot Noir in the Loire Valley has historically struggled. There are some delicious examples, but you really needed to buy it in a warm vintage because the Loire Valley is cold. And the reality is it is better suited for the production of white wines, which we'll cover off uh, later in the month. Um, but white wines from white grapes that have this high acidity and they don't need to have the, the skin of the grapes fully matured. So Pinot Noir from the Loire Valley was always very, very pale, very light, much like German Pinot Noir was. Um, very light, very pale, not particularly sort of complex or exciting. Now, climate change, the, the belt of where Pinot Noir is acceptably grown is shifting up. As you know, we're now growing it in the UK. And the reality is that Germany and the Loire are two regions that are benefiting from that. So they are both now producing much, much better Pinot Noir. And we do stock some Pinot Noirs from the Loire. Joe does buy them. But I would encourage you, if you like Pinot Noir from the Loire, please also try Pinot Noir from Germany. The Spätburgunders we have in at the moment are next level. They are absolutely sensational. So that's it from me. Gosh, I'm sorry I ran over. It was always going to be an ambitious task <laughs> to try and talk about so many grapes, but I hope you don't mind my indulgence throwing in a few others like Grenache and Malbec, etc. I like to have a fully rounded experience. Um, if you enjoyed this evening, please do join us for White Wine as well. And of course, the huge selection of online events that we have already on the website. We've got a full calendar up until the end of March. So have a browse, have a look. As I mentioned, any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm going to send an email out now um, and I will be sending the uh, videos that I mentioned. Oak, I'll send a couple of other links as well. And I'll also send some, um, some links to some great guides on our website, which hopefully will give you a bit of a hand. I hope it was helpful. I hope you learned a bit. Um, it was a quick fire session, but ideally we now understand a little bit more about some of the best red grapes in the world so the best thing i can encourage you to do is go out try more enjoy them explore all the grape varieties um and i'd love to hear what you think so thanks mahesh behind the scenes as always i hope you have a lovely rest of the evening <laughs>